welcome to Everyone Has a Story podcast, Chasing Perfection. Well, we've all been there, and I got some bad news, and I got some even more bad news. We're not going to be perfect. We are not perfect. And the bad news is, or the even bad, more bad news is, we're not going to be perfect. But that doesn't mean that we can't see it from time to time. Now, hmm. when we're growing up, you know, our parents want us to have perfect scores on our schoolwork. Our teachers want us to have perfect scores. And so from time to time, we will get that perfect score. You know, you've seen gymnasts get perfect scores at the, the Olympics. We see it, you know, a bowler get a perfect score from time to time. But you know what? It's from time to time. They're fleeting moments. Like my story today, I had a fleeting moment when I was perfect. I'm on my honeymoon. The resort we're staying at had this little village that had this carnival-like arcade portion to it. And so my wife and I are walking through it, and she sees in one of the booths this really cute little monkey, stuffed monkey with a safari hat on. And my wife looked at me, and she says, oh, my God, that is so cute. I want that. Well, I'm on my honeymoon. So what my wife wants, I'm going to get try to get it for her because it's our honeymoon, and that's what a husband would do. So I walked over to the guy who I think I had to wake up because there was nobody at his booth. I looked and I said, what's it going to take for me to win that monkey? He looked at me and he goes, you got to shoot. You got to hit the bullseye. I go, what am I shooting? So he hands me a crossbow. He goes, you got to get this one arrow in that target. And the target was a star about the size of a sheriff's badge. And he says, you have to hit pretty much the center because the star center is only like maybe the size of a nickel. He says, you can't have the arrow breaking the line that, you know, the boundary of the star, you have to hit pretty much the center. So I look back at my wife. She really wants this beautiful stuffed animal. Now, to let everybody know, I used to shoot archery competitively in a national level. And I grew up shooting guns pretty much every weekend with my dad. So I'm thinking, I've never shot a crossbow, but I've shot a bow. I've shot a gun. So I think I can give this a good try and maybe even win my wife that monkey. The guy hands me the, the crossbow. He's looking at me like, this will never happen. So I think he went back to sleep, actually. So I take my stance. I get my aim. I shoot. And I, I think the, the sound of the shoot, you know, the shot woke up the guy again. He looks over and he goes, Okay, so he starts to bring the the target back, and as it gets closer and closer, his eyes got this big. He goes, "Oh my God, I think he won." <laughs> and then I'm thinking, maybe I did. He goes, "No one has ever won on my ship. I've never given away a stuffed animal because no one's <laughs> ever won it." So now he's even more excited. That gets my wife to run over because now she's excited, and sure enough. I got it somewhere close enough to the middle where I did not hit the line, and I won my wife on my first shot, that stuffed animal that she wanted. Now, we still have that stuffed animal somewhere in our things, but you know what? What does it mean today other than just a, a nice memory on our, from our honeymoon? But those moments, they come and go. No, it's not a gold medal that someone might have got a perfect score on the gymnastics at the Olympics. But the thing is, it is a memory, but it's a fleeting memory. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And my guest today, Yasmina Lyons, we're going to talk about not chasing perfection and accepting not being perfect. So, Yasmina, welcome. Thank you for Thank being you. here. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. So, Yasmina is a global resilience and well being coach and trainer. So, what does that really mean? Tell us. So, so what that means is I work with individuals and organizations and really just go in and see how we can increase and enhance their resilience, which, which oh. in turn, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. So really increase and enhance their resilience, which in turn, in turn enhances their well-being and their sense of self 
who they are, how they, you know, how they approach life, how they deal with life, how they come back from setbacks. So that's really the essence of it. So let's talk about your reverence to not perfect. Because mm. we've all been there. I don't think there's probably very many humans on this earth that has not ever been told by someone, their parents, their teacher, their boss, whatever, that you, you need to be perfect. You need to be just special at this. And you need to be so unique that, you know, that perfection is the only thing that we will accept here. And mm. it's it's just not, you know, realistic. But like I said, from time to time, we are going to hit those moments. But mm -hmm. to be there day after day after day, you talk about getting burned out early in your career. I mean, if someone asked me to be perfect every single moment of every single day that I worked, I'd been burnt out by the time I got to my 20s, right? So what to get started, what is your really your reference to not perfect? What does that mean to you? Well, <laughs> When we think about not perfect, right, first we have to take it back and think about the word perfect. And in essence, I've been thinking about this. You know, I've even looked up the word perfect. But in essence, like, what is perfection? Because your idea of perfect may be completely different to my idea of perfect. In the in the example that you gave um, with this, with what happened in your honeymoon, right? So. In that, in that example, okay, so there's an agreed idea of perfection. You need to get the bullseye. But most of the time, that's just not the case in everyday life, especially in, in our lives, in our organizations. So in essence, the word perfect to me is flawed completely. And I actually really don't know why it exists in the dictionary because there's no such thing as perfection because everybody's a uh, definition of it, an idea of it is completely different. So you can't measure it in most cases. Unless you're aiming for a bullseye, right? Or you Unless see that score, or you see the score from the judges on the gymnastics uh, competition that they got the perfect 10, right? But other yeah. than that, it, it is very hard to really measure. So why does the whole idea of being perfect why does that really matter today that we can accept a definition, maybe not as it's so clearly stated, like in the dictionary or whatever, of being yeah. absolute 100 percent, no, no, you know, threshold of there. It has to be right here. Like my target, I had to hit the bullseye I had to hit. You know, so why does that matter today that we maybe not put ourselves in so much uh on that that level that we have to be perfect or we should chase perfection okay so when when we're chasing perfection right and when we're striving after this thing of perfection it, it, it like you said earlier it's the fastest way to burn out because if you're striving for perfection every day your anxiety is going to go through the roof. Your stress is going to go through the roof. There's no acceptance of yourself and maybe your gifts that you're denying or your strengths that you're denying because you're trying to fit into a box that maybe perhaps somebody has said, yeah, fit into this box. You need to fit into this box so we can get this result. But if, for instance, it starts with ourselves, right? If we're able to accept ourselves on our individual and our authentic, like, I think authentic selves and others are able to accept us for that as well then we may find new boxes and especially in today's world where everything is changing like nobody can predict what's going to happen in a year's time what we know last year is completely obsolete this year in most cases so this is probably the worst time to chase perfection in fact this is the best time to unlearn a lot of what we know so we can adapt to what's like being presented and what's evolving right before our eyes. And when I say that, I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about technology, climate change, uh, conflict, uh, economics, everything really. It's just, it's happening on a global level at every touch point. Now, I know you've had an experience in your life where you had that, that chase, you know, that dream of chasing perfection in your yeah. career. Tell us about that. Okay, so um, 
my so early in my life there was when I was younger and I'm not too sure I've shared this example with you before so I'm going to share it with you now Roger or this story with you before when I was younger and I was uh, 14 years old and probably before that I my mum was you know she's Irish uh, typical Irish woman, Irish woman, love her to bits. And then I've got my dad, who's Algerian. Now, when I was young, they divorced when I was very young. So when I was growing up, there was this kind of pressure to be the perfect daughter for my dad in terms of his expectations, like his cultural expectations, and then the perfect daughter for my mum in terms of her cultural, cultural expectations. So then in the home, there was, there was pretty much like a, conf a, a culture conflict, really. And it, again, where I was trying to chase both, like both ideas and both uh, expectations of me of this perfect daughter, right? In the end, I just, I just gave it all up, and then it actually led me to leaving home really young. So I left home when I was fourteen, and because of that, I left school. And that's an example of what happened on a personal scale for me when I was younger, but I think actually happens for a lot of people even. You know, when they're older in their lives, in uh, in their careers, they just get to a breaking point. And usually that breaking point then shows up as burnout, exhaustion, giving up, hopelessness, mental health, depression. It just shows up in so many ways. So if you can understand, like, the example. So, yeah. Mm. All right. So you've shared your example. How does someone out there listening, how can they become more aware that maybe they are down that path, similar to what I've described, what you just described in your own personal life, and that mm -hmm. they are leading themselves down this wrong path, this wrong rabbit hole, and that perfection is never, ever going to be obtained permanently. Obtained permanently. But, you know, you're going to have moments, you're going to have, you know, those those fleeting moments that I described where it's almost like that drug you need, you know, as an addict, you know, you just need that next fix, right? So we get that one moment that, oh my God, I can do it. And then we wake up the day so excited. And then before you know it, we've already missed the mark. So tell, yeah. tell us, how does someone, number one, become aware of this in their own it's life? A, number one, if, if, if in your own life you feel like you don't, you're not really getting pleasure from, from your work, from your life, from your relationships, that's a big telltale sign because it just goes to show that you're not, you're not really being, you know, you're not in your authentic self. You're not in that imperfect self that we are most of the time, right? And if, if also, you know, you, you're feeling feelings of, again, uh, like depression, if you're feeling anxiety to like live up to this perfection, if you find yourself comparing yourself to a lot of other people as well, that's a big telltale sign. Um, and I think, and of course, burnout is, is a massive one, but they're really the, the big ones. It's just, it's just not feeling satisfied with yourself and your journey. That's what it is. So there's been a study on youth and creativity. And these two major universities here in the States, I believe it was, mm. found that the result of this study was that there's a thing called the fourth grade slump. And what they found was that, that up until the fourth grade, probably seven or eight years old, that you are at your highest, your peak of creativity, because you haven't heard the word, no, you shouldn't do that. You can't do that. That can't be done. Mm. by our parents, by, you know, teachers, other adults, other people that we respect. And so my, you know, is that a form of burnout? Because, you know, if, if I'm feeling creative towards something, I feel like that's a perfect ideal scenario for me because I feel passionate about it, right? And mm. then all of a sudden I'm told no. So, if I'm continuing to hear no towards my dream, is that a mm. form of burnout? Because all of a sudden in the fourth grade, I no longer have that creative or as much creativity as I did just a year before that. Mm. 
Yeah, I've, I've never thought of it like that, but it could definitely be seen as a form of burnout. Because when you're burnt out, that creativity is like stripped away from you. In fact, on a biological level, you cannot be creative because, you know, you just, your whole energy changes, right? You've got stress, you've got the, the chemicals in your body, you have so much more stress in your body, which now your body's just going into that kind of like this survival mode. And it's hard to think about that with children, but actually past the fourth grade is when they're being told you need to get the right grades. You need to sit down and listen. You need to pay attention for how many hours. Uh, you can't play. You can't talk. All of these restrictions are being put onto you. And if you're not used to that, then that can cause that. So, yeah, it could definitely be some – it could be early programming of burnout even. Imagine that. Right. Yeah, I know. So let's get now to – from the childhood now to the adulthood. Mm. Does this chasing perfection – does it affect the business, the organization, the company that someone works at in business or their livelihood, their, you know, their, their adulthood livelihood? Does it affect the business and is it applied there as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> in so many ways. So number one, there's actually research being done into this, right? Because a lot of the times when you interview, um, well, especially here in the UK, when you're interviewed, you're usually asked like this typical question is what is like your weakness? What is something that you struggle with? What is, you know, something you'd want to improve with? And they found that in this study, a lot of the people that said, oh, my weakness or the thing that I would like to improve is I'm a perfectionist, right? So they studied all of these so-called perfectionists and what they found is these, these individuals, number one, they burn out quicker. They have so much more anxiety their productivity actually plummets. And the reason why is because a lot of the time, you know, the perfectionist will wait until conditions are perfect or until their idea is perfect or until um, their work is perfect or until they want to speak to their manager in the perfect like uh, scenario or have the perfect pitch to, to give to their manager or whoever that may be instead of just taking action. So it's, it, it, stop it, it just it contracts their productivity and their ability to add value really because everything is being over analyzed so then there's that and then you also have the, uh, the element of psychological safety so if you're working in an organization who expects you know this this perfection from you then you don't have that safety to put forward your thoughts your ideas, you know, you don't have that safety to put your hand out and say, hey, can I take on that project? You know, you just feel again, back to feeling contracted. So it, 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 it just, it contracts you, your performance, your creativity, your innovation, because now you're being forced into this box. Now, don't get me wrong, like in terms of perfection in organizations, there are some KPIs, like there's an organizational strategy, right, that we all have to adhere to and we all have to work towards and things like that. But there should be room for, le um, for yes, learning, but also for experimentation with safe boundaries in place. Because if you don't have that, then there will never be any like innovation and creativity. And sometimes organizations need that. Sometimes they need a shake up and they don't even know it themselves until it happens. Yeah. So before I have you put your coaching hat on, <laughs> I want to, there's, there's a couple different thought processes here. Obviously, you know, get yourself prepared, just like you said, to where it's almost overanalyzed, you know, where you, you are trying to be perfect before you, you know, get started on that project. And then there's a other train of thought is that says, get into the game, start moving and make adjustments as you go. And mm -hmm. I'm more, I'm leaning more towards that, except that a lot of people, they're so bit conditioned that things have to be perfect that when they get in the game, they get so overwhelmed because things are not perfect. You know, there's an old saying out there that says, don't compare yourself on your day one to someone else's day 100. Yeah. You know, the, the fact is that we have been conditioned to compare ourselves to someone else's day 100 or day 1000 or day 10 years on, mm -hmm. on our day one. And, mm -hmm. and right there, all of a sudden, 
we're putting so much, as you said, anxiety and stress on ourselves that all of a sudden burnout is going to be the next thing that happens to us because all of a sudden our 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 sense of uh, our goal is based on someone else's 100 days, 1,000 days, 10 years or whatever. And, and that is a form of chasing perfection. So yeah. there's a, another term out there. It's a Japanese principle for success called Kaizen, which means continual learning and growth. Yeah. Now, I know that you and your beliefs are more towards that. So talk to us about your solutions to help individuals or organizations put a pause on perfection and accept that continual learning and growth or that one step at a time to get there is going to be more than adequate for individuals and for businesses, but at the same time, less likely to, as you said, not reach that level of stress where really burnout is going to be the next phase of your life. Okay, so there's two strategies that I usually recommend with this. And um, the first one is controlling the controllables. And that is really where you have an outline of actions, right? Instead of chasing the outcome, because that's usually where the perfection is measured. So you have an outline of actions that you commit to, because it's much more likely that you're going to be able to commit to those and achieve this, not idea of perfection, but idea of, you know, pride and you build in that self-confidence within yourself, then achieving that big goal of perfection. And that's, again, going to increase in self-confidence and pride within yourself. And you're going to start taking steps forward. And then we have the second one, which is, you know, that self-reflection part. So this is something I do every week without fail. And I look back on my week and I always think to myself, OK, so what is that? What are the things that I have achieved this week? What are the things that I could do better? What are my wins, right? Because it's so important along the way to celebrate our wins, no matter how you know small they are. Because in, in, in our eyes, it could be small, but in others, it could be big. And sometimes when we have that big goal in our minds, we kind of like discredit them, but we shouldn't. And actually, there was a third one as well. <laughs> and that is, okay, so this one is really about risk assessment. And at this point, right, so let's just say, you know, as an organization or um, even as an individual, you have this big goal that you're chasing, this idea of perfection. And it's about balancing optimism with um, kind of worst case scenario, the risk assessment. And usually what I find is a lot of the emotion, the emotional drain that comes from burnout is because we haven't done a proper risk assessment of something. So we have a fear that something's going to happen, but we've never really sat down and said, hey, well, if this happens, what, like, what is the worst case scenario? And then on top of that, if the worst case scenario happens, what is the strategy that I can put into place? And then if you're able to do that, what you do is you kind of, you, it's like you put like kind of water over that flame of fear. So you settle it in your mind, You've, you're now equipped with a strategy, but then in the same breath, you do your best case scenario, what you're striving for. That's where the optimism comes in. And then you look for, you know, so what's the best case scenario and what's the strategy to get there? So now you're, you're, it's like you're going, it's like you're going into the kind of future, so to say, or, you know, your plan, your strategy with both. But a lot of people, and honestly, Roger, so many people, they never risk assess, never. Organizations and individuals, it's, it's a massive advantage to risk assess properly. And why do you find that is that they don't take the time to do that assessment? I think because um, for individuals, a lot of the time, sometimes they just don't know because of the, like the lack of direction and the lack of knowledge, which is completely understandable. But a lot of the times they just want to be optimistic. Like they just want to think of the best case scenario. But actually, and especially because my um, my area of passion is resilience, you know, too much optimism is not actually good for us. You know, I'm all for being optimistic, but too much is not because then you're not, you don't keep your feet grounded on the floor. And then when those adversities show up, when those setbacks happen, you actually can't deal with them. And it goes back to the research study and the perfectionist, right? They constantly want things perfect 
So their productivity goes down, their anxiety increases because they can't deal with something not being perfect. And it's the same thing with optimism. Well, well said. And it's a sad state out there that uh, we are setting ourselves up for burnout and we don't even know it. You know, we're, we think we're doing good. We, you know, what the culture and our society has, ex has ex taught us to do and what we expect to do. And all it does is just lead to more and more burnout. And sometimes even more than uh, once in a lifetime, it could go, you know, over time, you know, multiple times of being burned out. Yasmin, I can't thank you enough for being my uh, guest speaker today. And uh, please leave thank us with one more little piece of advice that could help us uh, clear our heads and 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 not have to be perfect unless you're aiming for that bullseye for your wife. <laughs> well, unless you're aiming for the bullseye for your wife, which is a, it's a very, very good uh, motivational excuse. All right. So <laughs> really, honestly, once you kind of accept your your true strengths and who you are and you accept that your journey is not going to be perfect that is really when you tap into you know things that you didn't think that you could do thought possible and your resilience that's it right because when you set yourself up for a realistic expectation of the journey and not a perfect one that's where you you know you embrace the journey and you go forth with a more of a growth mindset of learning, of development, of innovation, of being creative, than um, just chasing, you know, this golden idea of perfection. So yeah, that's 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 my ending quote. Well, thank you again. And if someone's out there listening or watching this podcast, how can they get in touch with you? Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm really um, present and active on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, you just type in my name, Yasmina. It's like Yasmin with an A at the end. Lions. L Y O N S, and also on TikTok. So I have quite a large following on there, and same username as well, Yasmina Lyons. So yeah. Well, thank you again. I uh, I appreciate the advice, and I hope that the the listeners really take your your words of wisdom and really uh, think about it hardly. So thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. My podcast wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for my sponsors and my uh, great supporters. So let me take this opportunity to thank each and every one of them. First of all, I want to thank Rebecca at Custom Bookkeeping and Accounting, delivering trustworthy bookkeeping services since 2003. Dave and Dara at Virtues Matter, making this world a much happier place to be with their Virtues card apps, coaching and workshops. Stephen at Buller Accounting, giving business owners depth and insight to their numbers. Eric and his team at Ivy Cat Web Design, the real superheroes of web development and design. Jennifer and Jean at the Seavers Real Estate Team, serving Pierce and Kitsap counties with their home buying and selling needs. Maury at the Maury Method, the world's only brainwave and trainment engineer, helping everyone have more clarity, less stress, and overall better brain health. Priya at Pivot My Profit, helping individuals and businesses have better control of their finances and more money at the end of their day. Melissa at the Soul Vibe Energy High, the queen of the aha moments, helping individuals find those holes in their cups, repair the hole, and gain back their positive energy. And finally, Rick at West Sound Recording. You talk, they do all the rest. Thank you, Rick, for all your efforts with the production and editing of my podcast.